Muhammad, but ultimately it denies the authority of God's word. That is the crux of the matter. And so the foundation is broken. They're at the wrong starting point, so they're going to end up in destruction, in, in hell, unless they receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and turn to him in saving faith in Christ and Christ alone. Did I see a hand? Yeah. Hank? Yes, exactly, and that's one of the areas that we can present as a witness. Well, what did God say to Adam? What did God say to Abraham, Moses, Jesus? Did, 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 was God not able to give them accurate teachings, revelation? Why did he need another prophet? Exactly, it, that's an area of witness that causes doubt in their mind that we can then point them to the inerrancy of God's word. Good point. And then we'll talk, Lord willing, next week about Judaism, but again, this area of authority, how important this area is, how important that we stand strong upon the fact that we have the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. And the Word of God is our sole authority for faith and practice. So important that we hold strong on this teaching. Uh, Judaism essentially rejects the New Testament. And, of course, Jesus Christ. So Islam, if we can boil down a summary statement about Islam, we would say life is about conquest. Life is about conquest. There are Muslims on different spectrums, just like there are so-called liberal Christians and conservative Christians. There would be, in a sense, some liberal Muslims more conservative Muslims, not every Muslim will actively try to practice a form of jihad and go out and practice violence and suicide bombings and terrorist activity, but its essence as a religion is one of violence. Muhammad was a very violent man. He was an immoral man. The teachings of the Quran gave him exemptions so he could participate in having concubines and having a teenage girl, I think it was even younger, nine, yeah, yeah, it was under the age of 10. That's right. Uh, when I was reading, uh, that's one of the chief criticisms of Muhammad is multiple wives, um, at least a, a concubine that he did not treat well, plus a, a child bride, um, these are facts about his life, okay? So let's continue here, and let's look at the background of Islam. Let's look at the background. First of all, founder, Muhammad, born in Mecca, Arabia, A.D. 570. In 610, he supposedly received revelations from God, which were dictated to him by the angel Gabriel. A secretary recorded these words in the collection of revelations, is known as the Quran, And uh, my understanding is it was the third caliph that actually collected the, the sayings, the writings, and actually put the Quran into its form that essentially is uh, the form that it is in today. So it went through some revisions. I believe there were some uh, pages that were burned that they said had been corrupted or mistaken or that weren't codified as Muhammad's sayings. So the third caliph finally put the Quran together into what we would recognize as the Quran today or the Muslims would recognize as the Quran today. In its purest form, it's, uh, it's only pure in Arabic. So if it's in any other kind of language, it's considered to be impure. But there's also a division among the Muslims. I did not get a map out and look up, but there's a big division between the Shiites and the Sunnis. The Shiite Muslims follow Ali, a cousin and son-in-law of Muhammad, whereas the Sunni Muslims are the more orthodox. They had a split in 661 A.D., and, and we'll hear about some of these divisions, even among countries, where one country is more Sunni, another country is more Shiite, and the Sunnis will be fighting for privileges and rights in a majority Shiite country and vice versa. 
And then there are entire countries that hate other Muslim countries because one is Sunni and one is Shiite. And uh, I did not go into a deep dive, and I still get it confused sometimes as to who's Sunni and who's Shiite. But there is a division even among the Muslims, major division that causes controversy even among uh, the Muslims themselves. So a little bit more on the history. Uh, 632 to 800 A.D., Islam expanded rapidly by military force. Notice those last three words. How did it expand rapidly? By military force, not by the work of the Holy Spirit convicting and God calling out uh, people to his name, not by what we teach in Romans 10, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. They expanded rapidly by military force. Muslims believe Islam is the God-sanctioned religion for the world. Christians, primarily Catholics, again, I don't put Catholics in the same category as biblical Christianity, but it was primarily the Catholics um, in the Crusades, Six or excuse me, 800 to 1300 AD uh, created uh, even more controversy than, of course, the conquests themselves and, of course, the differences in beliefs. But the Muslims will still point to the Crusades. Um, don't want to get too over the top here and get into politics necessarily, but a certain former president even would reference the Crusades as a justification for why certain Islamic activities should be allowed in the United States and tolerated, et cetera, et cetera. And he would reference the Crusades, which some people wondered about where he was coming from, where he was at, but there's other things there. So the Crusades, they love to point to the Crusades, but why were there the Crusades in the first place? <laughs> Earl? You go ahead. No, go ahead. Catholics, right. Right. And you have Muslims who are rebuking Catholics primarily for violent activity when what are the Muslims doing to, to you know, project their religion? <laughs> it's violence. Um, it, it, it's just the, hypo the hypocrisy alone. But yes, thank you, Earl, for giving us that, that explanation. And... So then let's look at a couple of maps here. I don't know how well you can see that, but I'll move out of the way for just a moment. You can see that Islam spread. So 632 is when Muhammad died. So he died in 632, and we're talking about this area right here. And you can see the spread, even into Spain. Um, Cassie's teaching Sunday school, but I'm sure she... And her dad would talk about some of the Muslim influence in Spain and Europe. Um, Sam, I don't know if that's ever come up. Yeah. So you can see the Ottoman Empire. Um, there's dates here. We have 732, the Franks stopped the Muslim advance all the way up here in the Battle of Tours there in France. You can see the movement into uh, the east, into Asia. So by 1200, and then we have... Uh, the Islamic lands by 1200. That's quite a spread. You can see then why so many countries in the Middle East and North Africa are affected by Muslim Islamic teaching. Obviously there was a pushback. This breaks it down a little bit more. 
So we have 624, we have areas under Islam. This is, again, about the time that Muhammad died. Um, everywhere that you see these little fireballs, that's where a pagan temple was destroyed by Muhammad. So one of the things that Muhammad reacted against was the paganism and the idolatry that was in the land in Medina, Mecca, in the 600s. So he wanted to consolidate religion into one God, and of course, he wanted to make who? The supreme prophet, and to consolidate the power into whose hands? Into his. And he became a very influential leader. Obviously, he was gifted as a leader. He was gifted, can I say gifted in, a, in quotes, <laughs> gifted as a military conqueror. This is the power of an individual with false teaching, with people who are not receptive to God's word, where God's word has been pushed aside, where there's paganism, idolatry, and what comes in? More wickedness, false teaching, deception. And Muhammad was able to consolidate the power with his influence, his abilities, his personality, and consolidating the military influences, and then he started into conquest, came back from, I believe it was, from, he went from Mecca to Medina and then back again, and then we see the Byzantine Empire, and a Muslim empire, we see the uh, Frankish kingdom up here in, in resisting that, and then we go into Asia and the other empire, the Sassanid Empire, but that shows, again, the influence and then, should be one, should be one more map, I thought. There it is. So we have that. That shows the spread. That shows a little bit more, with the green being the initial place that Islam started and spread. There we go. That's the one. I, I went too fast. There, I have a quick trigger finger today. Um, so there, the green shows the areas under the control of Islam by 733 A.D. But they were stopped in 732 at the Battle of Tours. But you can see then why North Africa is under so much Islamic influence, and even into these countries here, where we deal with Iran and Afghanistan and all that and then Saudi Arabia. Now I understand that Saudi Arabia has the strictest rule about, convert, about converting to another religion. And I believe that they will execute an individual in Saudi Arabia who converts to another religion. And there's an example in this, this one book that I have referred to quite, quite often in my study, um, produced by Answers in Genesis, and he gives the story the account of one individual who converted to Christianity and was beheaded in front of his wife and his, his child. And uh, so just uh, some hor horrible stuff. But that shows the violent spread of Islam and why it continues to be so influential in the world today. Yes? So is there reference to God in the Islam in that context? No. Their reference to God is Allah. Totally different God. Yeah. They claim, right, they claim that Allah, right, Good, good point. They, think, they, they believe that Allah is the one true God who is actually the correct uh, manifestation of God. The Jews got it wrong. Christians got it wrong. They got it right. They, they believe that Allah is the only God, but Muhammad was his fourth and final prophet and the greatest prophet, and so he shows the Muslims how to live. The only correct way to follow Allah, to be obedient to Allah, is to do what Muhammad did. He was the obedient, forthright follower. Yeah. Okay. Yes? Also, their theology is different from ours because their God is more Trinity. Correct. Correct. And so they may be Abrahamic in their original, right. in their origin, but they are very different. 
Right. Yeah. So they deny critical doctrines, original sin. They deny the Trinity. Yeah. And we'll get, we'll get to some of that. Thank you. So overview. In summary, Islam means to submit to God. Six articles of faith, faith in all law. Again, one God, Unitarian. They don't believe in three persons. One God, three persons. They don't believe that. They don't believe in the Trinity. Prophet Muhammad is the last apostle, the fourth and final prophet who corrected all the things that Adam and Moses and Abraham and Jesus didn't get right. And he came along and received the final revelation and on and on it goes. So he's the apostle of Allah. Existence of angels and devils. They do believe in a day of judgment, obviously based on works and how much and how well you kept the five pillars of Islam. And then Allah may even have a bad day, be in a bad mood and decide he doesn't want you to get into heaven. So you can do all kinds of good things and think that you made it and Allah may just say, well, you know, I just don't feel like letting you into heaven today. Go to hell. They live in that kind of fear. Judgment is a very scary thing. They have no assurance of salvation. We'll talk about this some more. The scriptures and the hadith, again, they're almost held into the same level. They'll say the Quran is their quote-unquote inspired book, but the hadith is very closely followed because that is how they believe that people should follow Allah. And it's based almost entirely on how Muhammad lived and what they think Muhammad would have done or what Muhammad did in a similar situation. So what is their desire in America? To get into a place of power and leadership and as soon as they can get it, they will have Sharia law. So politics and religion are intertwined. They don't believe in separation of church and state. No, the state is to be religious and to push that, require that, and to live according to those teachings in the Quran and how they're interpreted according to the Hadith and the example and the model of Muhammad himself. Yes? Yes, right, right. And they'll even allow for deception of an infidel. They actually, Allah says it's okay to lie to an infidel. So a Muslim can, this is, okay, without getting too carried away here, this is why, why, why in the world are we even wanting to sign a treaty with Iran? I mean, come on. How, how obvious can this be? They're the number one supporter of terrorism, they, they market terror. They export terror. They still hold that Israel should not exist. They called America the great Satan. They believe that by entering into a treaty, they can lie to the infidels. So how do you make a treaty with people who will bullface lie to you? So they made a mockery of us when we did a hostage exchange and gave, released $6 billion dollars in money that was held in an off, in a foreign account, and our administration, the administration of the United States, under the authority of a certain president, authorized the release of that six billion dollars. And America came out and said, "Oh, we're going to make sure that they only spend this six billion dollars on medicine and food and." All these humanitarian needs of the Iranian people. And right after that, the Iranian diplomat gets up and says, we're going to spend this money however we want. Mocked us. Well, that's what they believe an infidel deserves. Because they believe that Allah is the only religion, and anybody who does not adhere to it should die or convert. Violence, subjugation, and Allah's will is the eternal decree of God. So then the five pillars. This is basically the summary of how a Muslim should live, how they should practice this religion. I was in Kenya. There was a fair amount of Islamic influence in Kenya. 
not a not a majority or anything, but a fair amount. I don't know what the, I don't know what the percentage is today. And we were driving up country. We were driving along, and all of a sudden we heard ah la la, you know all that call to prayer stuff, and I'm supposing Arabic, and we drove down this road, and we were immediately told, do not take pictures out of the window of the safari van. Do not take pictures. And if they see you taking pictures, you could be in big trouble. And we just kept on, kept on going. We looked out, and they were bowing down to their, their mosque. Okay, It was creepy, very creepy. And we kept our cameras uh, safe, <laughs> safely put away. We didn't want any trouble. But they believe in reciting the creed of Islam, supposedly, if you... Re- repeat the Islamic uh, creed three times in Arabic, uh, sincerely, then you convert. Uh, Prayer five times a day in a prescribed posture. I mentioned last week, Minneapolis, New York City, are now broadcasting five times a day the call to prayer, which is actually an edict by Allah claiming authority and rights. So according to the corrupt officials of Minneapolis and New York City, Allah has the rights to New York City and Minneapolis. Because every time, five times a day, according to Islamic teaching, Allah is not just calling to prayer, he is claiming authority over that jurisdiction. Scary stuff, isn't it? Fasting, uh, one month of the year is Ramadan, sunrise to sunset. They have to forbid, I think, from eating, drinking, other types of activities. And uh, I forget what all is involved with that month of Ramadan. Giving of alms to the poor, I believe it's 2.5% is what I read that they are required to give to the poor. Pilgrimage to Mecca, they're supposed to make a pilgrimage to Mecca, and that pilgrimage is by the hundreds of thousands, if I remember right, from things I've read, and you'll see it pop up in the news. I think one year they had a stampede. Um, there were a whole bunch of people, I think, that died in that stampede because there were so many people in such a small area and there was some sort of panic. Um, but you'll see it sometimes in the news. I believe that's during the month of Ramadan. And then, of course, jihad, which is an internal or an external struggle. If you die in jihad, you supposedly, you supposedly go immediately to paradise, to heaven. And those terrorists who committed uh, murder... In, on 9-11, 2001, they were told that they were immediately, upon their death, going to go to paradise and have uh, celestial uh, physical relations with 70 virgins for eternity. And without being overly condemning here, it's a sobering reality that they woke up in hell and lifted up their eyes being in torment. It's a sobering thought. But that's based on the truth, the absolute authoritative truth of the word of God. They went to hell upon their death. And I don't know how many people that day went with them because they had rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior, though they were innocent American lives. It's a sobering reality. So when Jesus was questioned about natural catastrophes and man-made catastrophes, what did Jesus say? Repent, except you all likewise perish. So we're reminded of the need for all of us to repent. We're talking specifically about Muslims right now. But it's a reminder to all of us that we don't be self-deceived and die without Christ and go to an eternal hell. Some uh, overview of modern-day Islam, one of the fastest-growing religions in the world. Second largest religion in the world, 1.2 billion people claim to be followers of Islam. Muslims believe Islam is the God-sanctioned faith for the world. They believe it is the only true religion and everybody must subject themselves. I believe it is Iran that teaches a certain imam is going to come again and bring the world to a place of... uh, of heaven, and they have to prepare the world for the coming of this imam, something along that line. Um, Earl? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. You're up to two now. I didn't give you a special dispensation this week. (laughs) Just kidding. I'm just kidding. Hank's on his third already, I think. (laughs) I'm just joking. Go ahead. Yeah. And so they believe the preparation of the world is when the mosque shows up. 
Right. 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 It is. And Iran thinks that they are doing the imams and Allah's will in preparing the world for this imam to come. Yeah, sad. Here's a quote. Uh, senior Alex, uh, Alex Eve, senior fellow of the Center for Security Policy. Well, nobody knows for sure how much the Saudis have spent on getting a foothold in non-Muslim regions, and especially in Western Europe and North America. The sums are clearly huge. According to official information, the Saudis have built over 1,500 mosques, 210 Islamic centers, 202 Islamic colleges, and 2,000 schools for educating Muslims in non-Muslim countries. In addition to Islamic cultural centers, mosques are being built on the campuses of major universities all over the country. You can see they're trying to convert. Yes? So the imam that you mentioned in the last slide, yeah. is that similar to like in Buddhism it talks about the Maitreya and other religions that talks about a figure that's coming um, to enlighten mm -hmm. the world? Yeah. Well, you can certainly witness to a, a Muslim by saying, well, we believe the Bible teaches an antichrist, but he is going to be a false savior. He is going to actually try to take the world and to some degree of success, take people away from God and to hell. Paul talks about in the epistles, the spirit of the antichrist. Correct. It's already in the world today. Yeah, it's right. similar to this. It's, it's a, okay, it's... It's representative of the fact that man is looking for a savior. Because God has put eternity in the heart of man, general revelation, man made in the image of God, dignity, man's looking for a savior. We're desperately looking for someone to come and rescue us from all this mess. So who is the rescuer? If we really want to boil this down, who's right and who's wrong about who's going to rescue us? Well, I want a Savior who is holy and pure, who is sovereign, who gave his Son, who could be the only sacrifice, because only one could make atonement for the sins of mankind. And he had to be human, and he had to be holy. He had to be God. And only Jesus Christ could make that sacrifice and make atonement for the sins of mankind. But it's that same desire why do people fall for celebrities and rock stars and athletes and politicians who are full of personality and eloquent speech, but they are hollow as a ping pong ball when it comes to their character and their morals and their ethics? Because we want a savior. We want someone to come and deliver us. Well, God told us in his word how he's going to deliver us. It's only through Jesus Christ. And that's a good point. That's how we can help steer the conversation to give Muslims a hope that is found only in Jesus Christ. Yes, Kelly. Yes. Right. I, I'd much rather, humanly speaking, as you were just saying, wouldn't we much rather have a book that says that we're not sinners, that we can work really hard, that we can do enough good things, that we can have all this external stuff? In our humanness, that's what we want. And Muslim, Islam has a way of giving that to the unsaved person and giving them a false hope. Hank? Correct. Oh, yes. Oh, easily. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah, good point. Saudi Arabia is working on a peace deal with Israel. And we know there's going to be some blend of, people have talked about Catholicism and Islam, and there's going to be some appeal that Israel is going to get. We know the Antichrist is going to make the treaty. So, right. But, yeah, you're seeing even some of that in its possible very seed stages forms right now. All right, so basic beliefs of Islam concerning the Bible. We've talked a little bit about this already. Muslims accept the law of Moses, the Psalms of David, the Gospel of Jesus, and the Quran of Muhammad. Anywhere the Bible and the Quran contradict, Muslim accepts the Quran because he believes it is the most recent revelation. Again, the other books, the other prophets didn't get it all right. Muhammad came along and he got it right. The traditions or hadith is a record of oral traditions of what Muhammad did, allowed or enjoined, as passed down through the years by word of mouth. His life is a model and example. So there are groups, and again, this is sometimes why there are some of these radical splinter groups. We had a former administration that wouldn't even use radical Islamic extremism. They wouldn't use the word Muslim. Okay? Well, it was clearly an Islamic belief system, whether you call it a literal view of the Quran or an extremist view of the Quran or whatever, they were literally believing that they were doing what Muhammad did when he was alive to the infidel. They were following the Hadith in their interpretations. And again, you have various interpretations of Muslims for the Quran. Um, they're all wrong. They're all, um, they're all part of a, a false religion and a rejection of God and, and the Bible. But radical Islamic extremism finds its roots in the Quran, for one, which even teaches violence, jihad. Some interpret it very literally as a violent. Some make it more of an internal. But they are ultimately looking at the Quran and saying, this is their authority and this is what Muhammad would have done. So it's a religious Islamic extremism. Whether it's ISIS, or I forget, um, Hamas, um, Hezbollah, name the terrorist group um, over there in Afghanistan that we just capitulated to. Um, Cal- Taliban, thank you. That we just, anyway, I get so mad. I get, have to watch myself. We just gave billions of armaments to and has the Taliban gone away? Have they been treating people right? Have they been taking care of women and making, keeping all their promises? No. They're fostering terrorism right now. But they, they would claim they're following Muhammad, doing Allah's will. So we see very clearly in Scripture they are violating the Word of God. And uh, we see several references. What about God and the Holy Spirit? Muslims worship one God, whom they call Allah. Allah is the sovereign creator, judge, and ruler. Everything good or bad happens by divine decree of Allah. Results in a fatalistic view of life. And ultimately, Muslims deny the Trinity. Their theology is wrong. We continue. Concerning Jesus Christ. Jesus was a prophet, not God's son. He did not die on the cross. The man who was crucified at Calvary merely looked like Jesus. So when witnessing to a Muslim, one of the things that, you can, that we can say is, how did that happen? The, the, the gospel account that they claim even is part of the sacred writings from the past. It's clear when Moses, Moses I don't know what I'm saying, Mary and John were looking at Jesus on the cross, and Jesus said to John, Behold your mother, not in a papal sense or in a Roman Catholic sense, of course, but he was obviously recognized by Mary and John as being Jesus. So how did that happen? How did they slip? Okay, again, that's their way of trying to uh, deny the the deity of Christ, and uh, the truth of who he is. Yes? When they say that Muhammad came to correct all the errors, yeah. then that's just a fallback position. 
That's what they do, right. You know, the, the scriptures aren't correct. Right. And again, we go back to what Hank said early on. It's a great point. You mean Allah wasn't strong enough, powerful enough, good enough to make sure that all his prophets got it right? Well, the Bible is unified from Genesis to Revelation. One theme, Jesus Christ, no contradictions. Everything in the New Testament is in uh, accordance with the Old Testament. Often explains and interprets what the Old Testament says, but they are uh, the same as the absolute truth of the Word of God, inspired, holy, infallible, inerrant, authority for faith and practice, Genesis through Revelation. So you're saying that a whole bunch of people for 600 years had it all wrong and died and went to hell, and then Allah kind of said, whoops, I guess I shouldn't let all those people die and go to hell. I should actually give them a way out. And so he brought Muhammad along, who killed a whole bunch of infidels. You see what I'm saying? You see how ridiculous it gets? But it is a way that we can witness to them and bring them back to the authority of God's word, even regarding the teaching of Jesus Christ, who they even, in some places, I believe it's in the Koran somewhere, I saw a quote in this book I've, I've been using to study, they even make a reference to Jesus coming back and, and having some sort of leadership in a, in a great battle. So they even believe Jesus has another appearance and then dies in this battle. But they even hold Jesus up into some amount of reverence. And so you would even be able to take them to what the Gospels say concerning Jesus Christ. Yes? <laughs> yes. Sure. It's a big deception. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Scary stuff. And of course, we know various scriptures clearly teach Jesus Christ is God. Even the Jews recognize that. I and my Father are one. All men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. So Jesus Christ is who the Bible says he is. Concerning salvation, no assurance of salvation, no assurance of forgiveness. If the good outweighs the bad, a Muslim believes he will be allowed into paradise. However, anyone who gives his life in jihad or holy war is guaranteed admittance to paradise. We've talked a little bit about this. They'll, they'll even talk about Allah may even decide at the last minute that even though you've done a lot of good things, he's just not in the mood to let you into heaven. I mean, they live with that kind of fear. It's really sad. So we can help them in teaching the assurance of our salvation and through Jesus Christ. Uh, jihad's symbol is the sword. Of conquering the world for Allah, the symbol of Christianity is the cross. Sacrificing self that others may live. Jihad calls her sons to kill for Allah to achieve salvation. Christianity's God sent his only son to die for our salvation. Jihad achieves righteousness by works, entering paradise by killing infidels. Christianity teaches righteousness by grace, salvation by faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. I thought that was a really good quote by Daryl Miller. And then we're, I know we're running out of time here. I'll quickly put these up. But we see concerning the Bible, 66 books of the Bible are true and infallible concerning God and the Holy Spirit. The Bible emphatically states there's only one God, however God is triune. That's a point that we can uh, use to help witness to the Muslims. Uh, I hate to have to go so fast through this. I'm going back through some summary statements here to wrap this up. Jesus claimed to be God, not just another prophet. 1 John 5, 11 through 13 assures the believer of eternal life through faith in Jesus' death as sufficient payment for sin. Which then brings us to one last slide, and we conclude here, and we can have some final comments or questions I know we went through this very quickly today. This could, again, be another six-week uh, course. But we use 1 John 5, 11 through 13, even in our witnessing to a Muslim, that this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. 
He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Uh, truths eternal that are the essence of the gospel. Questions or comments? Yes, Nat. The third caliph put it all together and finally, it's a Muslim leader who has kind of like a priestly duty, yeah, kind of being a pastor slash priest slash, they were, that's right, the caliph, I'm sorry, the imams would be the priest or pastor type, that's right, imams um, would be um, like a caliph, or I'm sorry, the caliph would be like a Muhammad. So that's one of the things between the, Sinai, the, the Sunnis and the Shiites is who would be the next caliph under Muhammad. So the third caliph, he's the one who codified the Koran and said, this is the final version, no more. Thank you, yes, for that clarification. So the caliph would be in Muhammad's line. Yeah. I guess it would be kind of like the Pope, in a sense, the, coming down the line. And the, the Sunnis and the Shiites disagreed over who that uh, Caliph should be and had that split in the in 661, I believe it was. Good question. Any final comments or questions? Yes, Derek. Yes. Yes, at every turn it oppresses, it, it subjugates, and that's the essence of Allah, is he is a mean, angry, no mercy, very condemning, no compassion, totally different from the God of the Bible. And uh, Allah would never have mercy, never send his son. I mean, big difference. They don't know love. They only know oppression, subjugation, guilt. I close with this illustration. I heard a, uh, a preacher one time, he said he was on an airplane, and a Muslim sat down next to him, and they got into a conversation, and the Muslim was on his way to commit adultery. And the, the preacher, uh, a Christian, biblical Christian, born-again Christian, he said, well, don't you think Allah would, would be disappointed in you? And he said, oh, yes, Allah would be very disappointed. And he said, well, what, what are you going to do to fix this? And he said, well, I hope I can do enough good things to make up for this. And he said, and then, and then what, what will happen? What, what kind of hope that, that you have? And he said, I don't have any hope that even the things that I do will be enough to make up for this wrong. I can only hope that Allah might have mercy. What miserable existence. We need to uh, share the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, with these people as the Lord gives us opportunity. So hope this has been helpful this morning. Let's close in prayer, and then we'll prepare for the service. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the sure foundation that we have in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your inerrant, your inspired, inerrant, infallible word that you have preserved for us today, that we uh, hold dear, that we stand uh, faithfully, Lord, by your grace on the truths of the word of God. Give us opportunities, Lord, to be a witness and a testimony, even, Lord, as we might have opportunity with a uh, Muslim to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to share the good news of salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. Lord, bless the service now to follow, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you so much for being here this morning. We'll get ready for the service to start in about 15 minutes.